Hey guys, Will here. So today we're gonna to be kicking off our three-part review series on the Mozza R9 direct drive wheelbase and GS steering wheel. So today we're gonna to be looking at the hardware in detail, as well as doing some direct comparisons with some competitive products. Then part two tomorrow, we're gonna to take a look at the software and driving experience. Part three on day three, we'll be wrapping it all up with our conclusions. So let's just jump straight into it. So as always, a couple of quick housekeeping things just to give you guys the full context of what we're doing today. So firstly, a big thank you to Mozza Racing for sending across the base and the wheel for us to check out today. Same as always, we don't have any conditions on what we're saying here. This is purely just our own observations and our own opinions, but we do just need to let you guys know that they did send this across to us free of charge to check out for today's review. Now also wanna quickly let you know as well, we do have some affiliate links down in the description below for all the stuff that we're gonna be looking at today, including the other brands. We do also have a nice little discount code for Mozza Racing down in the description below for you guys if you wanna save yourself some money, if you do decide you wanna pick up some Mozza gear. So if you do decide you wanna pick up something that you've seen in one of our review videos, using those links down in the description is a great way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you guys. And we really do appreciate your support there. Now, Mozza was a bit of an interesting one. You might remember about five or six months ago now, we took a first look at their R16 wheelbase, which is also a direct drive base, but 16 Newton meters instead of the nine Newton meters that we have with the R9. And we ran into quite a few early teething issues there, let's just say. Uh, we discovered quite a few problems and I would encourage you to go check out that video just to kind of give you a bigger picture of where Mozza Racing have come from as opposed to where they are now six months down the track. Now outside of sim racing, Mozza as a wider brand has actually been making camera gimbals and other sort of electronic mechatronic type equipment for quite some time now. So they do have quite a lot of experience with this type of thing. So it's been really interesting over the last six months to sort of see how these guys have exploded onto the scene. Now we did have quite a few issues with those early units, but if you haven't seen those R16 videos that we did previously, basically the long and the short of it was that it seemed like it was a product that had a lot of potential. The software was quite good on the outside, but quite a few bugs and quite a few little, I guess, little details that needed to be further refined before we felt like that product was ready for the mass market. And yeah, basically we've had a bunch of people tell us that, you know, massive improvements have been made since then. So really looking forward to checking out the R9 and the GS wheel today and seeing how they stack up now six months further on down the track. So I made mention just before of Mozza Racing's ecosystem, so I thought the best place to start here would be to unpack that a little bit further just so you understand exactly what's available. I'll hit up the website via the link down in the description below to see all the various different products that they do have available. Just to give you a quick rundown on it, today we're looking at the R9 or nine Newton meter peak wheelbase. There's also an R16, which is 16 Newton meters peak, and an R21, which is 21 Newton meters peak. So nice and easy to understand from the names there. So this is their entry level wheelbase, but that is not to say that it is a entry level wheelbase when you compare it to some of the other products that are available on the market. It is direct drive. It is very, very smooth as you'll see in part two tomorrow. And although definitely on the cheaper end for a direct drive wheelbase definitely comes at a premium when compared to a lot of entry level belt driven or cog driven wheelbases that we see on the market. So not to be considered an entry level product, although it is the entry level into the Mozza ecosystem at the moment. So they also have a selection of wheels available, which I'm sure will expand over time. There's the GS formula style steering wheel like we have here. This is 300 millimeters wide and we'll be looking at that in detail just a little bit later on in today's video. There is also the RS wheel available too, which which is a 320 millimeter GT style wheel that's available in Alcantara or leather and also D shape or round as you see here. So as it stands right now, three different wheelbases to choose from, two different steering wheels, and then a bunch of other accessories such as dashes, mounting brackets, and whatnot, which we'll explore later on too. So let's set the GS wheel aside just for now and focus in on this R9 wheelbase. So although you don't have a reference point on camera right now, and we'll fix that in just a minute, the first thing you're gonna notice about the R9 is just how small its footprint is. So we're looking at, what is it, 14 centimeters long by 15 centimeters wide and 12.5 centimeters tall. That is obviously not including the nose. The overall length of the unit will depend on the wheel that you have mounted and what kind of spaces and bits and pieces you have between you and the base, of course. But if we bring in a CSL DD here by comparison, you can see just how much smaller the nine Newton meter wheelbase is compared to the eight Newton meter that you get with the boost pack or five Newton meter on the CSL DD. Now, interestingly, a lot of this surface area and a lot of this extra bulk is made up of the heat sink on the CSL DD. Whereas with the Mozza base, 
you can see there's not as much bulk created by heatsink fins on this unit. So obviously the larger the surface area, the more cooling capacity you have, the more ability you have to draw heat away and dissipate it. So it's gonna be very interesting to see how warm this gets in operation compared to the CSL DD a little bit later on. But having such a small footprint like this does give us noticeably more versatility when it comes to mounting and arranging things on your rig. So you can imagine if we turn it sideways here, you can put a screen nice and low just above the wheel. And you can imagine if the wheel is sitting like that, you can have the screen low enough that it's actually hidden just behind the tip of the wheel there, obviously, again, depending on the wheel that you're using, but you get the idea there. You can also drop the wheel behind it as well, have the base up nice and close. There's no cooling fans or anything like that in the back either. So unlike with the DD1 and DD2 from Fnatic, for example, you don't have to have a gap there to allow for cooling capacity either. So really versatile in terms of arranging your rig, but unfortunately not quite so versatile when it comes to mounting. So if we flip it up, on its side here, you can see four mounting holes here. That is the same arrangement. We'll put the spacing up on the screen for you guys. So those are M6 threads, and it's the exact same bolt pattern as we have with the underside of a CSL Elite wheelbase, a CSW 2.5, as well as a DD1 and DD2. So if you have a cockpit with provision for mounting one of those common wheelbases, then you're not gonna have any problems bolting this on, which is great, but it would be good to see the ability to do some sort of side mounting or something like that with this. So you do only have the option of those four M6 bolts on the bottom here. There's no channels on the side for mounting or anything like that, like what we have with the CSL DD and GTDD Pro. So on the CSL DD, GTDD Pro, we have T-nut slots along the bottom here, so you can put those in any position that you want, as well as on the side here. And if we lift up the GTDD Pro again here, you can actually see I've got a couple of T-nuts installed there for some side mounting brackets. Now there is a side mounting bracket available from Mozart. Unfortunately, I don't have one here to show you, but essentially what it is is a plate that the base sits on with two brackets that kind of come up the side and you can bolt in profile from the sides or however you want to bolt it on. But it's just not as clean a solution as having slots built in to the base itself, at least in my opinion. So with the exception of the back panel and the little plastic ring, around the nose here. Everything else on the unit is black aluminium. There is also the option for white as well, although I don't really know why anybody would wanna have a white wheelbase, but the option's there if you want it. So let's spin it around on the back now and have a look at our inputs and outputs. So again, very similar to the CSL DD, we've got a momentary power switch on the back here. CSL DD has it on the front. We've got a Molex connection here for our DC power supply, and we'll have a look at the power supply a little later on too. We've got a USB-B connection. We've got an RJ connection here for the optional emergency stop button, which looks like this. So just a short little lead with an RJ connection, and it's literally just a push button that you can release. So at nine Newton meters peak, this is considered a more entry level direct drive wheelbase, but nine Newton meters is still easily strong enough to cause you some serious damage, particularly if you've got young children using your rig. So it is a good idea to have an emergency stop button. And I do like the idea of having the provision for that. And just for comparison, that isn't something that's offered as an accessory for the CSL DD or the GT DD Pro. So nice to see that from Moza as well. And then lastly, we have a, another RJ connection here for a dash. Now, interestingly, the dash that we took a look at for the R16 and R21 wheelbase isn't compatible with the R9. So completely different mechanical connection on that. You can see on the top of the R9, there's a couple of little tiny tapped threads here on the top. So I assume that's gonna be for connecting some sort of a dash. And obviously we have the connection on the back as well. But as yet, we haven't actually seen what that dash looks like. It's not available on their website yet. So we can only imagine that's gonna be something that'll be available a little bit later on down the track. But if you wanna see how Mozza dashes work from the software side of things, then definitely check out the R16 video linked down in the description. So spinning around to the front now, we've got a lot of interesting things going on here, starting with the quick release. So you may already recognize this quick release as being very similar, if not identical, to what we have on the Sim Magic wheelbases. That is the case. It's based off an NRG quick release system, which is exactly the same as what you'll find in a lot of real world race cars. They're obviously not built to the same standards, but the quick release itself in terms of how the mechanism works is identical with the addition of some contact pins, which you can see in the middle on a piece of PCB or printed circuit board here. Now those are responsible for delivering power to the wheel. And if we have a quick look at the back of the wheel, you'll notice five little contact pins internally. Those are spring-loaded, so they push up against the contact pads on the PCB here, and that is what delivers power to the wheel. Now, you might be wondering about data. Data is actually handled via a Bluetooth protocol. So there's a little Bluetooth transceiver in the front of the unit up here, and then a little Bluetooth transceiver in the back of the wheel, and we'll have a look at those a little later on too. 
but that is how the base delivers power and communicates with the wheel. Now being a direct drive motor, this can actually spin infinitely. So you can imagine if there were cables internally, they would twist up and break. So what they've done is use an inductive coupling system internally here, which places essentially one half of a transformer in the base on the motor side and one half of the transformer in the stem side. And that's what allows power to be available through these pins, despite the ability to rotate that motor infinitely. So pretty cool design, similar to what we see with the CSL DD. They actually use a similar inductive coupling system for the power. They actually use an optical system for the data in this case. So there's a little optical transceiver in the back of the motor housing. And if you look at our CSL DD review, we went into detail on this, but you will notice internally here, there are a bunch of pins on the motor nose. So rather than using a wireless protocol like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, all of the power and data does actually come through those pins and then they transmit the data optically to get around the issue of being able to spin the motor around infinitely. Now I said this of the Sim Magic bases when we reviewed the M10 and Alpha a number of years ago now, and I'm gonna say the same thing about the Mozza bases. Without looking at aftermarket options, this is at least in my opinion, the best quick release available on the market today because it gives you a nice solid connection. It's easy to use, minimal fuss, and it delivers power and data. Everything you need all in the one place is proven to be reliable for us as well. And uh, yeah, it's just a really impressive quick release. In my opinion, at least a lot better than what we have currently with the Fnatic ecosystem. Now just to look at that, by comparison here. So what Fnatic have done with the CSL DD and GT DD Pro is actually make the entire stem or nose of the motor here replaceable. And that is to give provision for upgrading this later. So at the moment we have what's known as the QR1 system. They will be releasing at some point a QR2 system, although they've been teasing that for a while now and we haven't really seen any further news on it. So we don't know when that's gonna be available and how much it might potentially cost. Uh, but essentially what you're gonna be able to do is unbolt this. You can undo the little collar here remove that entire stem and then replace it with the QR2 system. Now, because of the ability to remove that, what we've seen is quite a number of people complaining about this stem coming loose over time, disconnecting. And often the way it'll manifest itself is you'll be driving and the wheel will just disconnect and you actually need to loosen the bolt, push this back in again and tighten it to get up and running again. Now, it isn't something that I've experienced myself personally with any of Fnatic's wheelbases, but I have seen enough people experience this that I would say that it is a inherent weakness in the design of this. And it's just one of those things when you make things replaceable and removable by the user, it's always gonna introduce the ability for things to come loose or you know not work the way they're intended to over time. So that is a difference in the approach there. And in my opinion, again, I do think that this is a superior quick release compared to the QR1 system from Fnatic. So let's take a quick look at the power supply before we take a look at the internals of the wheelbase too. So 19 by eight by 4.5 centimeters, a pretty decent hefty little unit here. We've got, as we saw before, a six pin Molex connection with only four of the pins occupied here that plugs directly into the back of the unit. Pretty much exactly the same as what we have with the CSL DD, just for reference there, although that is a four pin connection rather than six pin, but both are Molex. And it does have that little clip on there too, so it shouldn't come unplugged in operation. Two meter long cable as well, so that gives you enough lengths that you can put the brick away from the unit nicely. And then having a look at the specs on the back here, it's manufactured by a company called XVE. And there's actually an XVE logo on the front here, which illuminates when it's powered up as well, just interestingly. But we've got an input of 110 to 240 volts, 50 to 60 hertz, four amps max. So it is a switch mode power supply. You're not gonna need to worry about any sort of converters or anything like that, regardless of where you are in the world. And the output is 36 volts DC at five amps or 180 watts. So I believe the wheelbase is spec'd up to 150 watts. So there is a little bit of headroom in the power supply, which is good to see. And I didn't notice the brick getting excessively warm at all when we were using it. And then in terms of connecting to mains, we have a standard IEC connection on the other side here, and they include an IEC cable specific to your particular region. So they did actually send us an Australian plug, which was nice. And then on the IEC cable, they include an inline power switch here too. And that's got a little dust cap over it as well. Now, interestingly, on one of the R16 wheelbases that we tested, this switch did actually fail and stayed in the on position, the spring broke. But so far, this one's been fine. I've probably, you know, flicked the switch at least a hundred times now just to sort of see if we had an issue with it. And it seems to be all good. So hopefully that was a one-off issue. But this is useful if you want to be able to quickly turn the power off. You could potentially put this somewhere next to your seat if you don't want to pay the extra for the emergency stop button. Or if you just want to have a nice convenient way of switching this completely off rather than in in standby mode with a mains power switch 
rather than having to reach around to the wall. So probably not something that a lot of people are gonna use, but you know, it's a nice little inclusion. I'm sure those who will use it will appreciate it. And then you'll also notice a little ferrite core here as well in line on the power cable. That is of course to reduce electromagnetic interference or EMI. Didn't have any issues with EMI on the unit, but then again, we haven't had any issues with EMI on anything that we've ever tested here at Boosted Media. Look, overall very happy with the build quality that I see here externally, but obviously we do need to take a look internally as well and see what we have inside there. So let's go ahead and do that now. Okay, so taken the plastic cover off the rear and also just disconnected the IO board or input output board from that housing as well, just to give you a better look inside here. And first thing I actually noticed was that the, you can see a little bit of overspray on the aluminum housing here. So obviously that is painted rather than anodized, which I just thought you might find that interesting. Nice thick aluminum housing here, you can see what I was talking about before with the heat sink fins to increase the surface area and increase cooling capacity. You can see behind this PCB, and we might actually try and remove this PCB and get a look in behind there in just a minute, but you can see the motor actually occupies the majority of the space inside this circle here. So everything in there is basically the motor beyond this PCB here. We've got our input output board, which is responsible for power coming in, power switch, USB, and our external connections. And then this is our main processor board sitting on the back here as well as power distribution. So you can see the main heavy gauge cables coming in here. We've got some power distribution circuitry down here. And then we've got our main processor, which is an STM32 sitting up there. And look, I'm happy with everything that I see here. There's no issues in terms of the build quality on the PCB itself. All the connections are nice and solid. Good to see that they've used some adhesive as well to fix these connections in place so they won't work their way loose over time. Look, honestly, the build quality is pretty much exactly the same as what we see on something like the CSLDD, for example. But I don't see anything of concern here. There were a couple of things on the R16 when we looked at it, you might remember, there were some pinched cables up against some clips. We also noticed that there wasn't a ferrite choke on any of the data cables on the R16 that we looked at previously. You can see on this one, there is a ferrite choke there with the data connection actually looped through it as well. So that is all of our data running through to the front, which we'll look at in just a minute. Then on this little bus here, we've got a 12 volt connection, which provides power to our dash, and then all the data, RX and TX for our dash. The USB data is coming through here, as well as our connection to our e-stop. So relatively short little cable run here, even though this is unshielded, I assume it's short enough that EMI just isn't an issue there. And you'll also notice the 75 watt 10 ohm braking resistor that's sitting on the side here as well. So looks pretty hefty. What this is essentially doing is bleeding or dissipating away any excess current overrun from the motor spinning. So when a motor is spinning under its own inertia, it's actually generating power. And that's exactly how a dynamo works in a generator. So as the motor's spinning, it's generating power. And what will happen is if that power is injected back into the system, it can cause things like motor overrun, erratic behavior, things like that. So this resistor actually bleeds that energy away so that you don't get any sort of issues with that. And that's a common thing that you'll see across most direct drive wheelbases. Now you'll also notice up there a little blue Bluetooth transceiver chip too. Now that is responsible for the communications with the Bluetooth app, which we'll look at in part two. There's a second Bluetooth transceiver in the front of the unit, and that is what's responsible for the communications with your wheel. So what I'll do now is remove the bolts securing this PCB, and we'll see if we can actually get in there and have a look at the motor and the encoder. So we're actually able to get a pretty good look at the back of the servo motor here, and you'll notice on the shaft here, a little magnetic ring which actually spins around. Now being a magnet, obviously it has a magnetic field and a polarity, and as it rotates, that magnetic field will change relative to a fixed position behind it. Now, if we have a look at the PCB on the back here, you'll notice this little circle, and that little chip there is a Hall effect sensor. So what that does is that reads effectively the magnetic field of the magnet inside, and that is how it's able to understand the position of the motor relative to the static PCB sitting behind it. So that is how the encoder works. And you may also notice these two thin little cables underneath the three main power connections. That is a temperature probe or thermistor as well. So there's a little thermistor or temperature sensor sitting inside the motor housing too. So that is obviously gonna allow for any sort of thermal cutoff that might be necessary. And otherwise not really a whole lot of other stuff to look at in here. So I'm gonna get this PCB put back on and then we'll have a look at the front assembly. I might leave the back cover off just in case I need to pull any of these cables through to remove stuff on the front, but I wanna get this back in position because obviously I don't want any dirt and debris getting into the motor or anything to cause issues with the alignment between the magnet and the Hall effect sensor but hopefully that gives you everything you need to know in terms of build quality internally on the backside at least. And yeah, no red flags for me at all. I don't see any pinch cables, no bad quality soldering, nothing really. Everything is exactly as I would expect. So good, thumbs up.
Okay, so we ran into a little bit of a roadblock trying to remove the hub from the motor shaft. I managed to get the quick release off, and as you can see here, it does only have two wires as suspected, exactly the same as the R16, which we reviewed previously, and the Sim Magic bases. So that provides power through, and then as we know, there's a little uh, wireless module, little Bluetooth module sitting in the front here that uh, transmits the data or communicates the data with the wheel. So what's happened here is trying to remove the hub from the shaft. It looks like the center bolt here which actually screws directly into the nose of the shaft. It's got some epoxy resin or something like that on it. And it looks like a little bit of that has actually spilled over and it's kind of glued the hub to the shaft, which is fine. It's not a problem. In fact, it's probably a good thing for the user because it means it's gonna be that little bit more secure. Not that it should really make a difference. But what it means is that we can't get that hub off without putting more force through the shaft of the motor than I'm comfortable to do. I tried a blowtorch to kind of heat up the resin and see if I could soften it. I also tried dissolving it with acetone as well. So we tried everything that I was comfortable with doing. But what I do know is that it works essentially exactly the same way as it did with the R16. So we've got a PCB, which which runs around the entire ring here. There's a little Bluetooth module at the bottom of it. And then we've got basically an inductive coupling circuit. So we've got one half of it sitting inside the shaft itself, and then the other half sitting inside that PCB around there. So we've got a coil in one side, a coil in the other side, and that means that the sleeve is able to slip around the ring, but maintain a voltage and supply current within the hub itself, pretty much like two halves of a transformer. So we can see if we flip this little PCB over, high voltage circuitry there. So obviously the inductive coupling requires a higher voltage than the standard 12 volt DC that I believe the wheel runs off. So it's stepped up to a high voltage and then stepped back down to a low voltage again in this side and then that connects through to our hub. So sorry I couldn't get that apart guys, but I feel pretty confident. I feel like we've seen enough of the build quality here that we kind of know what we're working with. So I think it's time to move on to the wheel. So on to the GS wheel now. So to give you a little bit of context here, this is 499 US dollars, not including VATs and taxes and shipping and all those things. If we compare it to something like the Fnatic V 2.5, that comes in at 389 US dollars plus taxes. So a little bit more expensive or significantly more expensive than its Fnatic equivalent. Now this does have the advantage of, if we flip it over, analog paddles on the back and we'll explore all of the functionality in just a minute. If you do want to upgrade the Fnatic wheel to have analog paddles, it's going to be $179.95 US dollars and that upgrades the entire paddle assembly. So it replaces the magnetic shifters that come by default with the V2 wheels, uh, also adds two additional paddles at the top too. So that gives you a little bit of context for the expectations that we have in terms of quality and what we're comparing it to here as we push forward. So immediately having a look at it, it does have a little bit more of a toy like appearance. Again, that's a subjective opinion, but if we, yeah, just put them side by side here. Another thing that I do like about the appearance of the Fnatic wheels is the rubberized plastic that they use throughout the grips here. You can see on this, it's just a sort of hard plastic material. If we flip it around as well, you can see both wheels do have plastic backs, but again, the Fnatic has that rubberized coating, which continues throughout, whereas this is just a plain hard plastic. Now, admittedly, the Fnatic wheels do wear and tear quite badly in the areas where you have contract with that rubberized plastic. So it does end up going a kind of shiny plastic look anyway. So that may actually be a good thing in terms of wear and tear over time. But again, it's a pretty subjective thing there, but obviously something important to point out. Now, just while we're comparing the two wheels side by side here, another thing that I'm not a huge fan of just looking at the wheel at face value is the fact that the buttons actually have the labels as part of the button themselves. They're not removable caps or anything like that. So if you don't end up wanting to have these buttons mapped to what they say they are, you're a little bit stuck now you could put overlays on there. These buttons do actually illuminate. So that creates a bit of a challenge if you do want to change them to something else. But otherwise the wheel does have a lot of really great things going for it. So let's set the Fnatic comparison aside for now and let's run through what we have here. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten push buttons and they have actually a pretty decent feel to them. They're a little bit different from a lot of the other buttons that you'll feel on many sim racing wheels. They've got a little bit of a push to them before they actually activate. And it's kind of a really mechanical clunk when you push the switch in. So again, it's it, it's gonna be a subjective thing. Some people are gonna like that. Some people are gonna like more of a kind of a snapping kind of action, but it's very different from what you have with the Fnatic wheels, for example, where that kind of, it's a much more intentional kind of click. 
But if you compare it to something like a Asher Racing or a Cube Controls wheels, for example, those both have quite a short button press. So it's, it's very much a, you know, push it a little bit and it's quite a hard press, but it snaps very, very quickly. I actually quite like the feeling of it, but your opinion may vary. So that's the 10 push buttons. We then also have a couple of rotary encoders here for the thumbs, which I always love to see on a wheel. I particularly like using them for switching between maps and uh, brake bias, because those are things that we change quite regularly when we're driving. Formula One cars, it's quite handy for ERS modes as well. Anything that you don't want to have to take your hands off the wheel or take your eyes off the road to kind of be able to see where it is or anything that you might be needing to change mid corner as well. Now I'm happy to say that these rotary encoders have a really really nice feel to them. They've got anodized black caps on them and they are actually push buttons as well. You can push those in, which is cool, but they've got really, really nice detents on them. Now, again, if we compare that to the Fnatic equivalent, something that a lot of people have complained about with these wheels is how loose these are. They've got really soft detents in there. And what happens is when you push these, you end up pushing it more than once, particularly if you have gloves on, it's very hard to feel one click. Now, generally when I'm driving with this wheel, it hasn't been a problem for me. And I actually did a video about this about three and a half years ago now. What I tend to do is just kind of flick the switch up to make one change or flick the switch down to make a change down. And that tends to work pretty well for me. It doesn't end up running away on me. But with these ones, you can very, very cleanly feel each individual detent. So I would say objectively, these are better quality than what we have there. Subjectively, it's gonna just ultimately depend on what kind of feel you prefer. But I do like the fact that they are anodized button caps. So onto our rotary encoder slash multi-position switches. These also have black anodized aluminum caps on them, which feel very nice. And again, compared to the Fnatic equivalent, these are plastic caps that really don't feel very nice at all. And we have seen quite a few people have failures with these cracking and falling off. I haven't had it happen to me, but I have had plenty of people email me and tell me that they've had that issue. So again, objectively better quality hardware here than what we have on the Fnatic wheel. Now we'll go into this in more detail in our part two video tomorrow, but just to quickly let you know, these can be assigned either as rotary encoders, so one move equals one pulse in either direction, or as multi-position switches where it actually will remember and tell the sim what position is assigned to what function. So say for example, you want to go to engine map number five, you can go to engine map five and it will actually correlate to engine map five inside the game, even if you disconnect the wheel and then reconnect it again. Whereas with a rotary encoder, say you want engine position five, you go to five, it would work the first time, but then you might close the sim, leave it on position five, then the next time you boot it up, five becomes one and 10 becomes five and so forth. So that is the benefit of multi-position switch functionality. Not every sim understands it, so it's great that they give you the ability to switch between rotary encoder or multi-position switch. And on the GS wheel, all five of these are assignable, whereas again with the Fnatic wheel, only the left and right are assignable. The middle switch controls the function of the advanced paddle module if you have that installed. So then we have a couple of hat switches here as well. Now these look like they're analog. You can see they move around. They don't click in each position. They are also push buttons, but they don't click in each direction. They look like analog hats. But when we go into the software later on, you'll see that they actually operate either as a D-pad or a uh, digital button. So a little bit strange there. I don't know whether that's something that they intend to change to analog later on down the track in firmware or something like that, but they've got a nice feel to them. They don't spin like the seven way funky switch does on the Fnatic wheel, but I do like the fact that there's two of them. You could maybe assign one of them to looking left and right and the other to change between black box screens, one to assign to your menu in the game. Really, it's just great to have options there. And then if we spin it around, as we mentioned before, we've got two analog paddles here that can be assigned to either a two stage clutch, a single axis operated by either hand. So maybe a handbrake and sometimes you might want to grab it with the right. Sometimes you might want to grab it with the left or you can assign them as individual axes to whatever function you want. So maybe if you don't have the ability to use pedals, you might want to assign one to be a throttle and one to be a brake or something like that. So great to have options there. Now, not a huge amount of throw in the analog paddles. I was a little bit surprised by that. I think it is going to be enough for most people. But in my opinion, at least, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more throw there. And I believe it's using a photoelectric sensor to determine the position, but we might try and have a look at that a little bit later when we open things up. Now, in terms of the shifter paddles, you can see they're the little neodymium magnets. So they are magnetic paddles. They don't have any spring in them. And they have quite a nice action to them. Again, we don't have any adjustability there. So the amount of throw is the amount of throw. You can't move the paddles in and out like you can on some other alternatives, but a nice solid construction here. You can see black anodized aluminum cages as well as arms. And they've got a nice solid click to them. Really nothing to complain about at all there. Now they are quite loud by default, so you can hear. 
but they do include inside the box a couple of little rubber stickers on there which you can insert and that softens the click quite a bit. So it, is, it will be the loudest thing that you hear on your sim rig most likely, but most magnetic paddle shifters are quite loud. Again, if we compare to the Fnatic ones, they are quite a lot quieter. And the reason for that is that there's a little rubber stopper inside there. So when we put those rubber stickers on the Mozzle wheel, it's about the same level of volume. Now, as I mentioned when we were talking about the R9 base earlier, there is a little Bluetooth module inside there which handles communications and then power is delivered via the little floating pins on the back here, which are spring loaded and they make contact with the contacts on the front of the quick release as we saw before. And as I mentioned before as well, in my opinion, this is the best quick release available on the market, obviously with SimMagic being the same as well. Definitely a step up from Fnatic and I really hope that their QR2 quick release is as good at least as this is because it is a very impressive piece of kit. And the reason I like it is it's nice and solid, very, very easy to mount and unmount. And just in case you didn't catch it before, it is the exact same design as the NRG quick releases that we actually find in a lot of real life race cars. And again, we don't recommend that you use a sim racing wheel on a race car because they're not manufactured to the same standards, but at least you know the quick release is gonna be nice and solid. But look, otherwise, build quality wise, I'm actually really impressed with it. I feel it looks a little bit more toy-like than some of the other alternatives, but that's mainly just down to little bits of redundant plastic and things like that. The Alcantara feels really nice. Obviously we can't comment on wear and tear just yet, but it appears to be exactly the same material that you'll find on equivalent Fnatic rims. Spinning the wheel around, we can see little Teflon spaces too, so we shouldn't have any issues with squeaks, and we certainly haven't had any issues with that in our testing. And yeah, look, although it does look a little bit more plastic-like than other alternatives, it does have a very solid feel to it, I've got to admit. It doesn't creak when I twist it in my hands either, which I thought may be an issue. Obviously, your experience may vary with that, with the majority of the housing being plastic, but it has a nice, solid, hefty feel to it. 300 millimeter as well, so it's a good versatile diameter for driving a wide variety of different styles of cars. And again, it is one of the complaints that we hear about the Fnatic rims at 270 millimeters. You can see the difference there. These can make it quite difficult to drive things like GT3 cars. Now, in my experience, I do get used to it, but if I have a choice, I would generally choose 270 millimeter for fast formula style cars, so F1, F2, F3, and so forth, and something more like 280, 290, or 300 millimeter for driving GT3, GT4 style cars. So I do think it's a good choice going with 300 millimeter. It gives you a little bit more versatility than the 270 millimeter that you get with the Fnatic wheel. So before we take a look at the internal build quality, just a couple of other features to point out here. As I mentioned before, the buttons do illuminate. We also do have a programmable LED strip along the top here for our rev lights, and we'll explore that in part two video tomorrow. We don't have a telemetry readout like we get with the Fnatic wheels though. That is one thing that I think some people will miss and definitely one of the advantages of Fnatic wheels. Now, for those of you who might not know, that also gives us access to what Fnatic call our tuning menu, and that allows you to make adjustments to your force feedback on the fly without the need to exit out or alt tab out of your game to make adjustments in the driver software. Now, while Mozza don't have an on-screen display for making adjustments, what they do have is a mobile app which allows you to make adjustments on the fly from the phone. And that does work very well. You'll see that in tomorrow's video too. But all in all, in terms of build quality compared to what else there is available on the market at this kind of price, I think they've done a pretty good job here. The nitpicks that I have are really just down to subjective things like you know plastic design, things like that. In terms of objective quality, it seems very, very good. So let's take a look inside. So thankfully didn't have any problems with disassembling the wheel. Let's run through everything and show you what we found inside. Now, first thing you may have noticed before the forged carbon fiber faceplate here. And I didn't mention it when we were talking about other things because I wanted to pull it apart and have it a look first. Now it's five millimeters thick throughout there. And now the good thing that we can see here is that that carbon fiber does extend throughout the grips here. So that would explain why the wheel did feel quite rigid in our hands and there was no excessive twist in those grips, so that's good to see. If we flip it around there, you can see five millimeters thick there and forged carbon fiber on the back there too. So it looks to be genuine forged carbon fiber all the way through and there's more layers there than I can count, but if we get in there real close, you guys can see for yourself. So again, quality there on par with the Fnatic wheels, I would say, no issues whatsoever. Having a look in the back here, you can see there's quite a lot of things going on with the PCB. We've got a STM32 chip there. STM32 was the same type of process. It's not exactly the same uh, sub-model, but same family as what we had in the base, if I recall correctly. And then we can see the connections for our paddle shifters, which we'll look at in just a second, connectors for our thumb encoders, and there is our little Bluetooth transceiver for communicating with the wheelbase. So rotary encoders, and you can see the individual resistors there. So each position is a different resistance or a different value. 
LED strip sits along the top there. You can't quite see that in behind, but I don't want to peel the thin plastic away. It's like a little sealed module there. And if we get in on the side, you can see the rest of those buttons. They actually look to be decent quality buttons there in terms of their construction. I wasn't sure exactly what we'd find inside and they are hard soldered directly to the PCB, which is always good to see. Not only does that minimize the risk of me pinching a cable when I put it back together and breaking the wheel, but it also just keeps the design nice and clean. Quite a thin PCB there, but obviously it doesn't need to be any thicker than that. It's probably only a single layer or yeah, it looks to be just a single layer. I can't see any components mounted on the, uh, on the front side. And as simple as that, if we get in the side there as well, you can see the little variable resistors for our analog hat switches. Now it's, it is interesting that they don't have analog operation in terms of the software because they definitely are analog in terms of the hardware. But anyway, it is what it is at least for the time being. Now a couple of other things to look at here as well. Let's just quickly take a look at the grips. You can see the Alcantara material is cut away there. And look, this honestly looks like it could have come out of the same factory as the Fnatic grips. We'll overlay some footage from when we installed our pineapple grips on the Fnatic wheel. And you'll be able to see that that looked pretty much exactly the same with the way it's cut and stretched over and all glued in place. So no issues at all with the way that's been cut and glued into place that I can see at least. I'm not an upholsterer, but it all looks nice and clean. And it doesn't look like it's gonna suddenly pull through and you're gonna end up with gaps where it's, uh, where it's joining or anything like that. So nice and clean there. And interestingly, you can actually see some sort of a grease or residue, it's not glue, but I would assume that that is put in place to minimize creaking between the two sides, which is something that we didn't see on the Fnatic wheel when we pulled that apart. So everywhere we look so far, there's just little attention to detail, things like that, which uh, all positive things in my book. So let's have a look at the shifter as well. Now I was hoping when I pulled the little flap off here, I might actually be able to see the sensors internally, but all we can see is just the back side of the PCB. I'm not confident on pulling that apart any further because I don't want to break it, but there certainly doesn't appear to be a potentiometer in there. So I believe it's a photoelectric sensor for the analog paddle and probably a contact switch rather than a Hall Effect sensor for the shifter paddle, but I'm not 100% certain on that. So don't quote me on it, but yeah, I'm not confident pulling that apart any further. And I just can't quite see down inside to get a better look at it. But either way, it has a good feeling to it. And uh, yeah, you'll see when we go for a drive later on that there were no issues whatsoever with that. So then the quick release, just like what we saw on the wheelbase side, you can see the power connection here. So that's gonna be feeding our power through to our wheel. And it's a four millimeter thick steel plate here, which is actually affixing this to the wheel. Now you saw before that we had a plastic back shell on the wheel, but if we flip it around here, you can see there's actually a three millimeter thick piece of steel once again, and that is providing internal structure to the wheel. So the shifter, as you can see, actually bolts through into that same piece of metal. These four holes here are what line up with the four holes in the front of the wheel. So the carbon fiber is actually bolted directly to this as well. And then obviously you can tell the quick release bolts into the back here and through here. So all the various different components are all kind of connected in through this one steel plate here. Now the Fnatic wheel did have a similar design you can see in the overlaid footage, but maybe not quite as hefty as this. So yeah, it just goes to show, even though it has a bit more of a plasticky kind of look to it without that rubberized coating, internally it is strong where it needs to be. And that would explain why we don't see any issues with creaking or flexing or anything like that. So obviously it is an expensive wheel. It's more expensive than the base in fact at 499 US dollars. But if we compare it to something like a Fnatic wheel of equivalent price, I'd say that the quality is on par, if not exceeding in some areas. We've got nice aluminum caps on our rotary encoder slash multi-position switches. Same deal with the thumb encoders too. High quality buttons, five millimeter thick forged carbon fiber for our faceplate. A nice high quality PCB here as well with no excessive wiring or anything like that. It's all nice and tidy. No messy soldering jobs anywhere to be seen. And yeah, really absolutely nothing to nitpick about this wheel at all other than just a few little subjective things around the uh, redundant plastics. So I think that's pretty much everything to cover. I'm gonna get this put back together again, check that it still works. And we'll come back tomorrow with the software and driving experience. So that wraps up part one of this review series. Make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss out on part two. That'll be coming out tomorrow and we'll be looking at the all important software, calibration and driving experience with the R9 and GS steering wheel. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.